big, long story of lots of lessons today. So we'll get right into it. When I was a junior in undergraduate school, going to University of Illinois at Springfield, I volunteered at the Dana Thomas House. Anyone know what this place is? No? Okay. Well, like on many of the other buildings in Springfield, this house had nothing to do with Abraham Lincoln. In fact, it's one of the only ones that had nothing to do with Abraham Lincoln. It was a childhood home of Susan Lawrence Dana, the only child of Renewa and Mary Lawrence. That's Renewa. He was a man who made his fortune during the Civil War. By his pioneering Union Army, he went on to invest in banks and cattle and coal mines and railroads and lumber and real estate and silver mines and gold mines. He was so rich and powerful that he became a mayor of Springfield in the 1880s. And his only daughter, Susan, grew up to be a lovely woman, often the center of attention everywhere she went. But life was full of tragedy. She married three times and twice was widowed. Both her children died as infants. Her third marriage ended in divorce. In 1901, her father died. She inherited his vast fortune. Now, Susan sighed, it's time to upgrade my small family residence into a house that could attract important members of Springfield society. They'll help me in my causes of women's suffrage and equality for African Americans and other social justice causes. So she hired the young Frank Lloyd Wright of Oak Park, Illinois, who just recently shocked the architectural world by developing a new prairie home, which replaced the old box and Victorian style homes, the ones that had long extended horizontal shapes of open interior floor plans and furniture designed to match a specific home. In fact, Wright had in his contract, I can come back to your home at any time and see it, and he did. And he was an early riser. So his host would wake up in the morning and find he had thrown all their furniture out on the floor, front, front lawn, and placed it in his own, along with a picture of himself displayed in a prominent place. He was just slightly egotistical. <laughs> now Susan gave Wright an unlimited budget, as well as free reign to model and add on to her father's home. She said, just keep one room from the house intact in memory of my father. The home was this thing. A 35-room, 12,000-square-foot residence along with a 3,100-square-foot carriage house. It cost $60,000 at a time when most houses cost $1,500. The house contains many of the prairie school features, including low horizontal roofs and gently sloped gables, bands of windows, wide overhanging eaves, a large single fireplace, and an open floor plan. Built on the corner lot, has a large stone wall to keep the uninvited out, plenty of space for lawn parties, along with a reflecting pool, two indoor fountains, built around statues, a large dining room, a reception hall, a gallery, all with barrel vaulted ceilings, two balconies for musicians, and downstairs a billiard room, and a duck pin alley. Yes, she was living a little bit luxurious. Now, she lived in the house until 1928, and due to her East eccentricities and the reclusive lifestyle, she couldn't afford to maintain the house any longer. So she moved out to a small caretaker's cottage, where she lived until 1942, at which point she was declared now, and she was placed in the city hospital. The next year, the house contents were auctioned off, along with her personal possessions. In 1944, the house was bought by Charles Thomas. Is a local book publisher who, since many people did not like to write design furniture, brought all that up and kept most of the collections intact, using the house as his office until the state of Illinois brought it in 1981, making us actually extremely lucky to have a house that still reflects the work of Wright. There's not many of those out there. Many of them have been torn down and they don't have everything. This is one of the ones. But why did I talk about this house today? The house is a stranger in the town known for conservative styles of buildings. Springfield was, and still is, known for its most famous resident. Anyone want to take a guess who the most famous resident is? Yes. And the streets even reflect that. Downtown, the streets are still so narrow because they still broke on the idea of having a carriage go down. So on downtown streets, if someone's parked on the side, one car goes down. That's it. You have to kind of wait around. It's extremely annoying.
Now, the passage today has a stranger. But this one's a stranger on a seashore who defies our wildest expectations. Now, we know that this is Jesus, but I must admit that this is my all-time favorite passage in the Gospels after the resurrection. It has how juicy it is with so many lessons for us today. In the story, we have the disciples returning to Galilee to wait for Jesus as they're told to do. And since they're waiting to go back, they decide, let's go spend the night fishing. They spend the entire night on the lake unsuccessfully. And then they spy Jesus walking on the seashore. They don't realize this is him. And since this unknown person tells them to throw the net on the other side of the boat, that's where the fish is. Now, you're going to smell the tired man. They probably figured, why not? They kick the net over. They catch a large number of fish, which makes them realize that this event has happened before. When they first met Jesus, so this must be Jesus. Now, not only are they reminded that Jesus has total authority over everything, but they depend on him. And he cares for them. It's revealed in the fact that when they get to shore, he's always cooked breakfast for them. And we then run into my favorite part of the story, when we have Peter, who once boasted he would never abandon Jesus, only to do so hours later three times, now confesses three times publicly they love Jesus, allowing others to see that Jesus forgives Peter which most likely made Peter back into the inner leadership. Because Peter is now given responsibility to care for his people during difficult days to come. Now Peter chose to follow Jesus, no longer able to be the free, independent, energetic fisherman of yesteryear. He's now going to live a life of constant danger and hard work, which ended with him arrested and crucified upside down on account of his loyalty and love for Jesus. The passage leaves us with some questions, of course. Why are disciples not able to recognize Jesus? Now, maybe this is because all seven of them have been fishing for the entire night, and they're tired. It's also quite dark. And it would be hard to recognize anyone from a distance. Now, also, why does the passage indicate that Peter gets dressed before jumping into the water? That really makes no sense to us. I get undressed and jump into the water, right? Well, Peter most likely was wearing only his undergarment. It was a short tunic, common for the workmen at the time. They keep themselves warm, but they allow freedom to move. And if you ever, um, I've never fished like this, but Pat, when you were in Israel, did you ever see the fish with the nets and everything? Did they, okay. Well, there goes that again. But anyway, they would fish in the nets, and, you know, it, it allows freedom to move. And now, he most likely threw on this outer garment to help him swim to shore. And that way, he's properly dressed when he greets Jesus. Now, all the disciples arrive on the shore. They have to drag the net. They find breakfast waiting for them. Jesus shows us that he does not depend on our simple, poor efforts. We are to preach and witness to others. That's our charge. But salvation does not come from what we do, but only from Jesus. Now, I told you I love this story. And that's because there's so many lessons we can find on it. The first lesson is where and when the story takes place. Now, most of the resurrection appearances happen in and around Jerusalem. And either happen on Easter Sunday or maybe the week afterwards. This one happens in Galilee, probably at least two weeks after Easter to allow for travel time, which is why we do it on the second week after Easter. Now, we have this little group of disciples. Most of them are fishermen in past lives. And they decide, let's go fishing. Now I wonder how the idea came up. These guys, they're not giving up. They're not saying, hey, we've hoped in vain. There's no Messiah. It was our dream. His kingdom's not coming. Let's go back to our old careers. No. These guys have seen Jesus. They've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit by Jesus. They have been ordered to go to Galilee and wait for Jesus to appear again to them. I have to wonder maybe if... Before this account begins, the disciples have gotten into a little spat. After all, Peter is still in the group, and all of them would have known he had denied Jesus three times. So far, Jesus has yet to forgive him. So maybe, just maybe, mind you, Peter is being isolated. So he decides to go fishing. And the disciples just support him go with. Now, I think this is a point worth talking about. We have these men still together, but why? What held them together? 
The Lord and Master had been executed for treason against Rome. The shepherd had been smitten. The sheep had scattered. But now here they are, back in Galilee, back in their homes, not trying to escape by separating, back where everyone knew them, where they knew everybody, where everybody knew they had followed Jesus to Nazarene. You know, you guys are from Coggin, and I've noticed that everyone knows everybody in this town. You know, and most of you guys are related to everybody anyway. So, I can't go anywhere without people knowing, oh, that's Steve, the pastor. And I ran into a guy at a gas station. You work at the church. You're the pastor, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Are you going to church? No? Oh, sorry. <laughs> See, these guys had every right to separate, but they were together because they knew that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. They worshipped a risen Lord and they present the united front to the world. Now, look who's in this group. Simon Peter, John, Nathaniel, Philip, Andrew, James, Thomas. Most part, the original members of the church. Look where they are. They are on a beach. Perhaps the same beach where Simon, James, John, and Andrew have been called three years before. Across the lake over there was where thousands were fed. And across the lake over there, that's where the devil-possessed pigs jumped into the sea. And here, this road up here, that road goes to Cana, where one of the small group came from, and where the wine had flowed like water. They're all friends, but they're human, just like us. Nothing special. We have Peter who denied, and Thomas who doubted. Peter, a man whose foot and mouth syndrome I can relate to. He's always ready to say more than he meant. Thomas, a man who's a bit slow, always gloomy, always ready never to look an inch past his nose if he could help it, always ready to do more than he said, and yet the cross has united them together. Both have failed in their faith, and yet here they are. Learn from these men. Learn that Christ welcomes you back when we fail, and fail, and fail, and he makes us better than we've ever been before. And then we have Nathaniel, also known as Bartholomew. I was going to pull a picture up of uh, Bart, Bart from uh, Spaceball, but I couldn't find one, so anyway. Now he's from Cana, guileless, swift to believe, ready for his confession, childlike, always so loving and faithful, persistent, quiet, growing in faith every day. He's rewarded for his faith, just like we can be as well. And then we have the sons of thunder, John and James, eager, energetic, bigoted, ready with a passion rebuke, and wanting to evoke destructive vengeance in all the love of Christ. Now imagine that. There's a story that they, uh, Jesus and the twelve are walking through a uh, Samaria, and they go to a Samaritan village. And Samaritan village says, no, we don't want you guys. It's more than 12, it's probably like 500 people following Jesus. We don't want you here. We don't have any food for you. Uh, excuse me, Jesus, you're, you're the Messiah. Can we please call down fire from heaven? No. But they are ambitious for Christ. He's touched them. He's changed them. And then we have Andrew, the front man. Very religious. Always searching. Always wanting to know more and yet keeping quiet about this. And then we have Philip, the true evangelist, who wants to bring others to Christ from his friend, the gen friend, from his friend to Gentiles, to a little boy who had fish and bread to give and who knew all he needed to do was see the Father. Every single one of those disciples are common, undistinguished men. But every one of them, like all of us, have a place in the church. We don't need to be brilliant. We need, don't need to be clever. We don't need to be influential or energetic. We only need to be willing to have Christ use us as he will. So they go fishing. The entire night, it's fruitless. They're tired. They're coming to the shore. They're thinking, let's go have breakfast and get a good day of rest. It's been long. It's been cold. It's, you know, they're on the sea. Cast after cast after cast and that's been made. Nothing has been drawn in except tangles and mud. They're tired. They're wet. They feel like failures. They've been in, unable to do what they are supposed to do. They get close to the shore and they see the stranger walking on it. Hey, do you have anything? No, or 
you could probably add in a few choice words here. Well, fish on the other side of the boat. Oh, the fish are hiding there. Oh, this is stupid. It's the other side. They, they're on the right side of the boat. Okay. They laugh. They kick the net over. But they obey. They obey. Here's a lesson for us. Being a Christian is not a comfortable experience. Now, sometimes your nets are full. But often you fail and are disappointed. Christian work must be done. With no results at all, parents to the doer. But be sure of this. That we who learn and practice the home, homely, wholesome virtue of persistent adherence to the task that God sets us will catch a gleam of Pentecost, gleam of presence real, blessed, and who before we die will know our labors have not been vain in the Lord. They that sow in tears will weep, reap in joy. Now, we've all failed in this life. I can't think of one person who's ever done 100% correctly except for Jesus. But like Peter, we can learn, if we listen, that failure is not the end of the story. One day, Christ is going to ask each of us, did you catch anything in this life? He will ask, what did you do for man down there on earth? And I hope your answer will not be like the disciples on this morning. No, we haven't caught a thing. But look what happens when they obey. They throw the nets over the side. The net is filled. Now maybe Jesus created the fish there on the spot. Maybe he used his omniscient power to guide the fish from some other part of the lake to the net. Maybe he used his omniscience and seeing the fish coming, hey, cast you now. It doesn't matter. They obey, and suddenly they are unable to haul this net in. Seven strong men unable to bring the net to shore. Seven men having failed so miserably for an entire night to catch even one fish, cannot, cannot even haul in a God-given net of fish. But think about this. The net does not break. It doesn't break. And look at our lesson three. The cry of John. What does John say when the net is filled? It is the Lord. That should be our cry. Who is Christ to you? Is he a powerful being that has gave you life, power in heaven and earth, created all that is? From him comes deep life, sucking from the fountain of life. That's what we do. We believe that only from God can existence come. The whole history of the world is but the history of his influence, with the center being the cross of Calvary. But you cannot understand until you understand the living power of Christ truly and personally. Christ gives sight to the blind. Christ gives hearing to the deaf. Christ cleansed the lepers. Christ gave life to the possessed and feet to the lame. He showed that he was Lord of all. He cursed the fig tree. He commanded the winds and the waves to be quiet. He raised, raised the dead. He deposed Satan from the throne on Easter. But all of them, all these people, including Satan, still had acknowledged his authority and asked for his blessing. They all have to know Christ. And you cannot know Christ unless you love him. You cannot argue your way to the throne of God. You cannot buy your way to the throne. You cannot bargain your way to the throne. You only get there by love. And those who love Christ will be loved back. That love is going to spill over to others in joy and peace and hope. And people will know you are a Christian by that love. They're not going to have to ask. Fourth lesson of the day. God is this kid, and what you do and what you don't do. He's here right now, and He knows what you're doing and thinking. He gives us a promise in the story. If you come to Him now and acknowledge your dependence on Him, He will provide. We must obey His words. Now, it may be we won't see the results of our toils until death, until the morning dawns. And our net is drawn in by angels. But since why we are totally in this life, know that Jesus watches from the shore. Jesus is interested in our weary efforts. Jesus will guide us if we tell him we need him, and he will give us hope. Disciples land on the shore. They find a meal has already been prepared for them. 
Jesus built the fire. He's procured the fish. He's dressed and prepared them. Disciples, they add to the meal, yes. But Jesus has been the benefactor in more ways than one. Now the disciples add to the meal 153 fish. What does this mean? Well, as a biblical scholar, we love to argue, we love to drink, and we love to talk about this. So I've heard that this number represents God and the church. So 100 is the fullness of the Gentiles. 50 is the remnant of Israel. 3 is the Trinity. On all whose glory all things are done. So, 153. Or I've heard that August, Augustine stated that 10 is the number of the law, 7 is the number of grace. If you add 10 plus 7, you get 17. And you add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus blah, blah, blah. All these 17, you get 153. So, 153 stands for all who by law or grace have come to Jesus. Or 153 equals every kind of fish in the Sea of Galilee mean that one day all people the nations will be gathered to Christ. Or it just means the disciples had a very good breakfast that morning. And brothers and sisters, Jesus is at this meal for a reason. But first he feeds these men who are tired and hungry. He feeds their bodies and then deals with their hearts and spirits. And he will take care of us the same way. He will give us bread to eat and water to drink. He will answer our prayers if we make them but we must know him first. Know him means asking me, Lord, your life. You get to heaven, not on what you do, but who you believe on. You come to church every Sunday, your life, that's good. You can read your Bible daily, that's good. But unless and until you have asked him into your life, you're not going to be one of his sheep. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We only sit down at a table with a stranger on the seashore. And the meal seems to have passed in silence. And Jesus now gives us our fifth lesson. He turns to Peter, who's been quiet, and asks him a question three times. He's not asked the same exact question each time, but a different version of the question each time. The first time, he says, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than others? Agape means deep love. He's asking, Peter, do you love me more than your fishing? More than your meal, more than anyone else on this planet Earth. Peter, who once boasted, simply says, I am filio with you. Filio means I am fond of you. Jesus nods and says, okay, keep on tending my little lambs. You're forgiven, but you're not back in leadership yet. And he asks, he says, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? No more comparing Peter to others, not simply you and me. Peter shows he's honest. He says, I'm filial of you. Now, Jesus has tested Peter. He gives him a higher task. Shepherd a flock of sheep. You're good now. You get your own little group to lead. And he asks one more time. But he changes the words. Simon, son of John, are you filial of me? Now, Peter's had his tables turned on him. And now, in extreme grief, gives up everything. And he says, Jesus, you know everything. You know I'm filial of you. For the first time, it's more than the fondness of a friend. Now it means, I'm a servant, and I love you, Lord. He's passed the test. And finally, we come to our final lesson of the day. Be ready to follow. During this conversation, Peter and Jesus have been walking down the beach, and Jesus turns to Peter and says, follow me. Peter nods and begins to follow Jesus down the beach, but he turns back, and he sees John. And suddenly, everything he has left rushes back in. He asks in a fit of jealousy, Lord, what about him? Jesus responds, what's that to you? You follow me. Ignorance is not an excuse for not serving God. There are people out there who will say they will never serve God until he answers all the questions. But let me tell you, there are many things you will never know and you do not need to know. It's not your business to know. You are to follow him. My sisters and brothers, Jesus Christ must be the Lord of your mind. He must be the Lord of your heart and the Lord of your will. If he's not the Lord of all this, he cannot be the Lord of your life. We must follow Jesus as Lord and follow him wherever he has called us. In following Jesus, we will be called into one body with a different place in that body. Now some of us have different struggles in our walk. 
always be under attack for our faith. And some of us will experience prosperity here on earth. We ask to share that to advance the kingdom. Some of us will die young. Some of us live to a ripe old age. But the key is to follow God, what He's planned to do. Do not seek what He's given, not given you. Do not be ungrateful for what He's given you. Follow God whatever it costs, whatever location. Hear the call of God today. Do you love me? Then follow me. Do my will. Show your love for God. Teach classes. Pray. Go to Bible studies. Come to worship. Fellowship all in love and joy and peace. Go out and make disciples of all nations. In the name of him who lives and reigns eternally, one God, and three.